Well, my new book, Leadership Essential Selections on Power, Authority, and Influence, um, is an outgrowth of everything I've done before. Just the way it, it seems to me that the work is generally cumulative. Uh, certainly, when I uh, put together this collection of seminal readings, I had in mind that it was not just about leaders, but about followers. Uh, but the attempt really is to do something that hasn't been done in the leadership literature yet, which is to establish that there is, in fact, what I call a core curriculum of great readings by leaders, about leaders, about leadership and followership that, uh, of course, in my somewhat biased view, uh, should be read by anyone uh, who has an interest in leadership. This is, the, this is a literature collection as much as it is a collection about leadership. It's, it's really writing that is, uh, in some cases, great because it is of its literary merit as well as its content. But it happens always to be about leadership and followership. And, and uh, it is, in that sense, really the outgrowth of a lifetime of work in both leadership and followership. Well, it's funny that you ask about bad leadership, which of course is one of the books I've written in recent years, uh, because this collection deliberately has omitted uh, two, and I name them in the introduction. In the introduction to the book, I describe why I included what I included and also why I excluded what I excluded, and one very vivid example of somebody who was, I teach this person in my class on leadership literacy, but the person, the publisher and I finally made the decision to exclude Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf from this particular collection. Uh, it belongs because I think of it as great leadership literature, meaning it had a very profound impact on the history of the world, that book, Mein Kampf. But we excluded it because the content that I would have selected uh, is so offensive to so many that finally the decision was made to leave it on the cutting room floor. But, you know, in my lexicon, the word leadership is value-free. It, it doesn't mean either good or bad. I don't equate leadership. I know many of my colleagues do, but I don't equate the word leadership with anything particularly moral. So um, selections in this book are about good leadership, bad leadership, indifferent leadership, and followership as well. Anything can be, most anything can be twisted depending on who is, um, who is using the material. But uh, in general, it is meant for intellectual edification and as a primer, as a primer for people without particularly getting involved in what constitutes good or bad. I would not actually single out any as being more important than, you know, do I say that Plato is more or less important than Machiavelli? Do I say that Machiavelli is more or less important to be familiar with than, uh, than Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail? Uh, do I neglect Freud? Do I neglect Mac Max Weber? Do I neglect Lenin? You know, these are all, um, they're all seminal. They're all classic. This is a book of the classics. This is not the contemporary, there is nothing in here, not a single thing that qualifies as contemporary leadership literature. Every entry in the book is at least 25 years old. Most of it, of course, goes back much further. And I guess I, I would add that the book is divided into three primary sections, and maybe that will give you a bit of an idea. The first one is great writers writing about leadership. The second one is great writers, leaders, writing as an act of leadership. So, for example, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels' Communist Manifesto was intended to be in and of itself an act of leadership, and God knows it was. Rachel Carson's The Silent, Silent Spring was in and of itself an act of, act of leadership. By most accounts, it was the uh, beginnings of the modern environmental movement. And finally, there's a section that, has, uh, that is the voice of great leaders themselves. 
So you hear people like Nelson Mandela, but again, I choose the unconventional for selection. So I don't choose Nelson Mandela as uh, president of South Africa, but I choose a speech that he delivered at a trial, the trial that preceded his incarceration for nearly three decades, the Ravonia trial, where he says at the end that he is prepared to die for what he believes. So I, um, this really covers a fairly wide swath, and I would not single out anything that is more important for contemporary leaders. To me, it is, as I said, a kind of core curriculum that people who think about leadership, who think about how to be a leader, becoming a leader, and people who are leaders, think of themselves as leaders and managers, it's, uh, it's the great, it's a kind of mini great, the great books in one book. The debate I had was not, I did involve other scholars to a degree. I had a few sessions with some of my colleagues. Did they think that any people that I w was including should be dumped? Uh, conversely, were there some names that I was forgetting about? And that yielded a few ideas. But I would say that my main conversation was with students over the years. Uh, as you know, the Kennedy School uh, not only has Americans, but students from all over the world. I tried to be global in this book but I admit that uh, it's not as global as in a perfect world I would try to be. But as I said in the introduction, um, the work is universal and the work is timeless. So um, uh, I would say in the end it was my students who guided more than any other single group what, uh, what got put in and what got left out. They let you know plainly, clearly, and simply, and in no uncertain terms, what their preferences are. And basically, uh, the course has gone exceedingly well. You know, it's a course that uh, involves the big themes of the human condition, as this book does. So um, it's it's a it's pretty exciting. It's 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 the greatest ideas ever in human history. How can you go wrong? Well, I address that question. Um, in, in the uh, introduction of the book, and I actually talk about a debate. There's a debate in education much more generally, not just among leadership instructors, about what do people in this day and age, in the, 21st, in the 21st century, what do people need to know? And as you know, uh, increasingly there's emphasis on professionalization, on narrowing, on taking courses uh, college is very expensive, uh, people want to know they're getting value for their money. So that raises the question, how does a kind of liberal arts curriculum, the great ideas, impinge on practice? And as I say, in my view, there's no direct connection. For me to say that um, reading, here let me give you some names, I'm looking at it, reading uh, Mary Parker Follett, or Saul Alinsky, or Hannah Arendt, or Leo Tol Tolstoy. Do I argue that reading the section on War and Peace that talks about the role of the great man or woman or great leader in history is going to lead directly to how you manage your organization tomorrow morning? That is not the argument. The argument is that just the way you go to high school or college to be, have a broader understanding of the way, of the trajectory of history, of the way uh, the world works, of the human condition. So this book is intended to not develop any particular skills, but to make you, if I may use the word, wiser. It's about wisdom and not any particular skill.